Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, ornithochirids and Brazilian fossils, flappy flaps and rocks. What more could you ask for? Hello and welcome to episode two of series eight of Terrible Livers. Livers? Livers. It's Terrible Livers today, Dave, because I've been drinking too much. What, <laughs> what's new? <laughs> so um, we got some lovely feedback from last week's episode and uh, we just thought we'd continue the theme of interviewing amazing other paleontologists who aren't Dave. And what I thought, Dave, is considering like Series 7 that we had an entire series on pterosaurs, pretty much, I thought, why not get an actual pterosaur expert on instead of just Dave all the time? Yeah. So, and where did you get that idea for that episode? Is he, was it before or after I emailed you and said I'd like to hire you as a speaker? <laughs> it might have been after, but... Uh, yeah, I thought so. I, um, you're just the talent. I'm the um, directorial power. I'm not at all. I'm just I'm the dog's body in this entire thing. Well, I was going to say yeah. if, we, if, we, if we're doing if we're doing the making tired jokes about things, if you said the other paleontologists who aren't Dave, I think you find all the other paleontologists aren't me, unless there's something going on I don't know about. I've I've been learning about the recent like a couple of weeks ago. There's a Nobel Prize and the whole sort of spinning electron things and ah, uh, not uh, yeah, quantum mechanics. I didn't yeah, mean so electrons. Re- I mean reality particles. is locally unreal. Apparently, exactly. I think. So there could be an opposite paleontologist to Dave. The anti-Dave. I can, I can give you a few suggestions. You're quantumly <laughs> entangled. You're quantumly entangled, spinning up while the other one's spinning down instantaneously. Anyway, we shall crack on with this um, interview. I think it's a really cool interview, this one, because not only do we talk about ornith- ornithochirids. <laughs> the, bird, the bird hands the bird handed pterosaurs yeah. there you go we also get on to talking about fossils and uh, the trading of fossils and the complications mm. surrounding that which is really interesting i think so um if you're into um either flappy flaps or indeed buying fossils and doing that ethically uh, this is the episode for you so please welcome the wonderful taisa Hello and welcome to Terrible Lizards and I'm very pleased to announce that on the podcast we have an actual pterosaur expert and it's not Dave because we have Thaisa Rodriguez. You're calling us all the way from Brazil, are you not? Yes, I am. Which bit of Brazil are you in? Oh, I am um, a few hundred kilometers north of Rio. Things are very far here, so yeah. a couple of hundred kilometers, like next door. But but you're on the coast, right? Yes, I am on the coast. Yeah. But you're um, a professor of paleontology, and you are, as far as I'm aware, that Dave's told me, you're an expert in a certain type of pterosaur. Is that right? Yes, that's right. I try to be an expert in more than one type, but well, in the end of the day, I am an expert in um, iron ware. Or nitochirids. In what? Uh, those are very, I mean, they are the nicest uh, pterosaurs. They are <laughs> really, they are really, really cool and they are large and they have all this very interesting thief that they use to, you know, just snatch, um, possibly snatch some fishes. So I, I'm laughing when Taisa says, like, they're the nicest and best fossils because what I know and no one else knows is that, in particular, they started off being a complete nightmare until you fixed large chunks of this. So oh. the, they started off being known by loads and loads of fragments from the UK, so the Cambridge green sand. And they're all like jaw bits. They're like the front 10 centimetres or less of jaws, all worn, all broken, all with the teeth missing. And their entire taxonomy is based on work done by Richard Owen and people of that era in the mid 1800s before we found the rest of them. The rest of their body. (laughs) Yeah, the rest of the head and then the rest of the body. And you were responsible for that massive paper. Was it 2010? Is it that long ago now? Uh, 2013. 2013. So. Okay, nearly 10 years ago now of that huge yeah, right. revision, like sorting out an awful lot of the correlates between all this fragmentary nonsense from the UK and the spectacularly better preserved and complete and, and um, wonderfully good condition material from Brazil. And that's why I always think of you as like the ornithochirid slash anhangarid expert, because you like that's the paper i reach for every single time i have to do anything on these animals which is not very often because i hate them because they're horrible taxonomy (laughs) and rubbish british specimens 
<laughs> they are, but I mean, it's wonderful to think of how, how many things they were able to do, like Richard Owen, like several years ago. They had tiny bits and isolated parts, and still they managed to discover so many cool things about their source. But then here, a lot of those pterosaurs are preserved as like almost complete skeletons. So of course, it's, I mean, that's not that often, but we do have a couple of them that they are pretty, pretty nice, nicely preserved. So we can know actually how they look like and uh, how large they were. And well, perhaps even uh, some different proportion, proportions between wings and legs. So, you know, we try to figure out how they flew. Well, you know better than most people about those things. I, I do, but you telling me is less interesting than us trying to tell the audience. <laughs> <laughs> the specimen that, that always rings my or, or rings a bell in my head is annoyingly obviously not in brazil but in tokyo and the anhangera i mean it is one of the most spectacularly well preserved things it is possible to see i mean it's 90 plus percent of the skeleton almost every single bone is in perfect condition including a magnificent skull i posted a handful of photos on it on my blog years ago and of course your supervisor alex kellner wrote a monograph on it which again is still like one of those absolute deep Default, but oh, I need to know the anatomy of a pterosaur. Yep. Well, this is ev- almost every single bone illustrated in multiple views because it's 3D preserved and perfect. Yeah, that, that's what the skull looks like. That's what the palate looks like. That's what that joint on that bit of wrist bone looks like. Well, and then there's some good news about those this specimen. Um, well, Alex described it in 20... 2003. Oh, 20, 000, Kel- 2000, Kel- 2000, uh, 2003 or whatever. Kellner and Tamida. No, 2000, you're right. Kellner and Tamida, it's, yeah. it's a pretty long time, but now they do have CT scans of the specimens in Japan because you know it's already the 21st century and we get to get you know new images so uh, one of my students he actually um, went to Japan just before uh, the pandemic and he was able to get uh, the CT scans of the skull and uh, of the neck so uh, we know that those scans they exist perhaps they have no more scans for the rest of the body so pretty soon I hope we will have more information information before we get into the extra information that we might find out soon i want to know what we know about them so far you said they probably ate fish and they had teeth that's all i know yeah i'm an True. idiot i don't know anything <laughs> and they're pterosaurs so they're, they're the big flappy things how big are they compared to Oof. like an ashdarkid or an agnurognathid how big what were they doing okay so what do we know way larger than an oregonated but way smaller than us dark kids but they're still large. We have like some juveniles, might be like five meters uh, when they're, you know, up wingspan, when they have the, the wings open. And we do have one specimen that might reach some eight or nine meters. So they're pretty large. Not, you know, not Quetzalcoatlus large, but still. That's nearly Quetzalcoatlus large. I mean, Quetzalcoatlus is what, 11 meters ish? Yeah, 10, 10 to 10 and a half. So yeah, nine. Because yeah, so was that Tropignathus? There's a yeah. really big jaw that. You- I think you were on it that is. paper with Alex and a couple of others. Yes, this specimen ago. is like massive. It's not just, you know, long, it's robust. It's something like uh, very noteworthy. It's fantastic. Well, um, hopefully we will um, have some some of this part of those fossils have been found out after the museum got fired. I mean, I, I, I would say very approximately that you could describe them as Pteranodon with teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Hang on, hang on. That that's that's Ludodactylus is Tyrannodon with teeth. Yeah, yes, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. Is it one of them? I've heard of these. I know about these. Hey! I've heard of one of them because of the name. There we go. Brilliant. The thing is, uh, Pteranodon, they they seem to be very flat. All the fossils are <laughs> very, very, very flattened. And those fossils are not. They're like very 3D, like you're actually seeing an animal and not something that was just crushed to death. So it's pretty cool to see this. We can get, you know, a lot of information from those fossils because they are 3D. And there's only so much we can do with 2D fossils like Ludodactylus. Okay, it's there, but how was it, you know, on the inside? I don't know. But with most of your worries from the uh, Pomaldo formation, they are like super cute, 3D preserved. We can see everything. 
The only thing is it's very hard to get in CT scans because um, CT scans, they work better when, we, when you have like differences in, in contrast between the bone and the rock. And the thing about those fossils is that, you know, their contrast is pretty similar. So mm, that's a problem. I've always, always wondered about that because if you're presumably replacing the bone with parts of the rock, the rock and the bone are going to be made of the same stuff. So how, I, I don't really understand how CT scanning works other than it takes ages if you ever have one and <laughs> you're in the hospital. It takes ages and it makes a lot of noise. Yeah. Yeah. Density difference is the key. And yeah, as you correctly say, they're often very similar in density. And then with pterosaurs, it's even worse because they're highly pneumatic. And so they tend to have been, they're not just stuck in rock of the same density. They're then filled with rock of the same density. And so, yeah, they don't show up. <laughs> It's pretty hard. Um, I mean, uh, I've seen one of those pterosaurs from China that I work with, and we had uh, like eggs CT scanned. And one would might think, oh, well, it's preserved in some kind of rock that's not that similar in composition to the bone. So we will have some nice CT scans. And But no, it was really, really hard to get good CT scans. Because CT scans, it's like uh, we're, we're having several slices of x-rays. So just get one x-ray and then another x-ray and then another x-ray and just stack it up, you know, in a 3D form. So we need to have this contrast, this density um, difference between them. And, you know, because they're filled with the rock, it's so hard to get any image. I just heard the word egg and I got really excited. Oh, yeah. But it's another pterosaur, sorry. I mean, they're not that far from iron gorids, but they are found in China. And we have like 200 eggs from this pterosaur. So that, that's... Um, Hamipterus. Ah, Hamipterus, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's incredible. And, oh, it's so hard to get those eggs sitting scanned. It's yeah. a nightmare. And then I'm like waiting for for a Brazilian egg that never comes. Why is oh. that? Oh, no. But, but, it's, but it's, it's worth saying because yeah, because yeah, you were part of the team that did Hemiptera. So before like 2005, something like that, we had no pterosaur eggs. Then we got two in consecutive papers in the same journal in Nature, and then another one about three years later. Then about five or six years later, we got the Darwinopterus with an egg, and then we were still stuck on like five, which from naught was amazing. And then as I said, like oh, and then this site in the Jungar Basin in northwest China. Oh, we got. 200 <laughs> it's like oh that that's a slight uptick in our number of pterosaur eggs well it's something of a of a site really it's a major discovery in the middle of nowhere <laughs> in the jungle basin and then they have so many pterosaur bones just you know cropping out from the from the ground i've never walked you know i never stepped on pterosaur bones before i went there and I'm like, oh, they're everywhere. <laughs> I shouldn't be stepping over here. It's everywhere. What makes this site so um, prevalent for pterosaur bones? They possibly lived over there. They maybe it was some kind of nesting site or something. So and eventually they would die. You could get you know something like um, a storm, and then a lot of um, the adults would die or something like that. We we are not sure really because um, besides the two hundred and something eggs, we have hundreds of bones. And most of them are disarticulated. And disarticulated bones, they indicate that those bones were some kind, um, they had some kind of transport after death. So they could have all been washed to that place or something. Yeah, perhaps. It's likely. So so that's my question, having dug in other bits of the Jungar Basin and surprisingly close to where you've been. I know bits of the Jungar because that's where I dug up some Sungaripterus material. Ooh, and what's a Sungaripterus? Sungaripterus. So Sungaripterids are really really cool little group um, that are probably close to Ashdark oids. So Ashdark kids are Quetzal classes, big ones, and then various other beaked things, some of which are probably some fruit or nut eaters, and some of them some very uncertain biology because there's not very much of them. And then their next nearest relative are the Sungaripterids. There's only a handful of them, mostly from China, a couple from Germany, and that's about it, I think. And they famously got very robust jaws and very robust teeth and appear to have been like clam crackers and, you know crab 
eaters and things like this. That's what they're doing. But Sungaripterus itself and a very close relative called Noripterus are both from this bit of northwest China. And the interpretation there is that you've got more or less like a giant, a big inland lake in a desert. And therefore, pretty much the only way you can easily get there is if you fly. You know, big dinosaurs and or even crocodiles and other things are not going to want to track across a huge amount of desert. And then when they get to a lake, there's nothing to eat. But if you can fly there and then you can eat the shellfish at the bottom of that lake, you can do well. And yeah, I've dug in some of those places and 90% of what you find is Sungaripterus. There's loads and loads and loads of pterosaurs, but they're nothing like as dense as Thaisa is describing. And so I don't think I've seen anything written about this with Hermitrus because there has been four or five papers on it now and various bits of eggs Oof, and other stuff. They have so many people studying. Is that supposed to be something similar, which is why you're getting so many? I'm not sure. It might be. Um, I know that they have so many different students working on the site right now. So not only the pterosaur workers, but also like geologists and other sort and now and I have no idea what they're doing right now because I haven't been to China since before the pandemic. So yeah. I have very little news on that. And they're very, very secretive about those things. Oh, I, I, oh, I know. because Yeah, because <laughs> I was working down the hall from the people who knew about this site. No one ever told me. They are very secretive. I think they're very co- competitive in China. We got, we got as far as they're much larger. There's one that's incredibly large. They've got teeth because Ludactylus has got teeth yep. and the fossils are really good because they have we got lots of 3d examples of them unlike other pterosaurs what else about them makes them like different and distinguishable from the other types of pterosaur have they got crests are they yeah they have crests Yay! so um a lot of pterosaurs have this uh those very very large crests on the back of the skull like pteranodon or, or even zungaritus birds have a much smaller crest but they're mostly on near the tips of the jaws so both on the upper and the lower jaw they're like Ooh. well semi-circles yeah there's a little semi-circle like top this. and bottoms it, it makes almost a little disc right yeah, up the they're front much of the smaller than the other ones they are like cuter so a lot of people would you know at the beginning people were just asking themselves what are those crests doing perhaps they would have some i don't know biomechanical advantage but of course now most people as Dave has already told you a lot of times they believe that those crests are used for some kind of uh, communications between males and females Uh, we do have some evidence that those crests would you know grow larger uh, when they were growing older so likely uh, the sexual um, selection hypothesis is the correct one for those crests as well but they look pretty cute it's like very small crests on the tip of the skull or just about the tip so if you're looking at them if they're looking sideways do you see the semicircle or do you see the semicircle if they're looking straight at you which way Uh, when they're sideways you will see a semicircle and you if you were just um, just looking at them straight away, it would be a very, very thin thing, bony thing. It's really small uh, compared to other pterosaurs. They were very, you know, flamboyant. Tell me more about what they were doing. You said they were fishing right at the start, do we think? A lot of those pterosaurs, especially the ones uh, that we find here in Brazil, they were found in a place that was like a major lake, uh, like 180 kilometers large lake and completely full, full of fishes, several, several different uh, species of fishes, different genera, a lot of things going on, like from, well, from, from rays and small sharks to uh, bony fishes as well. So they were probably feeding on a lot of those fishes. They had a lot of things you know, going on. Of course, you want to find a pterosaur that has a fish in its stomach, but it's so hard to find one. I do actually know one skull that's actually laying on my desk for about 10 years now. Oops, sorry. <laughs> that has one very small fish vertebra uh, near the mouth. But then, not sure what that means. It could, you know, just be transported there, you know, during fossilization. But I mean, it's the, the only could thing I have. It. Of those. Oh, you could have it's on pretty the small. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. It's so small. I don't think that's the case. But I would just. It's just so hard to find the stomachs, and I don't have one stomach, you know, with a nice fish inside it. But the teeth, they are very, you know, uh, thin, and um, uh, the, the teeth at the front of the skull, uh, they are like kind of making a rosette. So they are like slightly curved. So it would be really, really uh, interesting to catch fishes. 
or perhaps other animals that could live on that lake. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're really not far from crocodile teeth or dolphin teeth or Spinosaurus teeth. Yeah. You know, it, it's the fish catching jaw. I mean, they, they yeah, really, really are. Perhaps more similar to gharials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it wouldn't be fit to, you know, just chew on things that are harder. No way. The other thing I drop in, which is, is kind of relevant, is, is just their, like, transoceanic nature. A lot of this early stuff described in the UK, we think are the same species that Taisa and people have got in Brazil. And then there's very close relatives in Australia and in China. You know, that these, these are animals crossing oceans. I mean, obviously, we wouldn't know if it would be in, a, in an animal's actual lifetime it w- if it would circle the globe. But is, would that be possible? I think it is possible. If you take a look at the Chinese Iyengar, it looks just like the Brazilian Iyengar. It's, it's fantastic. It's the same thing. They could fly and they were large enough to you know, make migrations or perhaps if not you know, seasonal migrations, they could just you know, fly to, you know, to, to find another habitat, a suitable place to live or something. It's um, totally uh, possible that they flew all around and we just, you know, lack the fossils. So where are they? Um, we have to find yeah. more. I mean, them. I mean, remember that there's a whole bunch of birds for whom that's fairly trivial. Pterosaurs in general are very good flyers and these are built like albatross. We haven't really said that, you know, they are very long, thin winged. They look super adapted for that kind of oceanic, low energy flight and getting lots of, you know, energy from the wind and not doing lots of flapping. And lots of the birds that do that the big gulls and albatross and stuff are fish eaters and fish on the wing and do things like this yeah that it, it's looked likely slash plausible for 20 30 years and i've never seen anything that looks like it would contradict it as Tracy said proving it trickier i i thinking about it isotopes might do it i know there was some nice work that thomas tootkin did if you remember him looking at sauropods showing that they had sauropod teeth which if they ground down the individual enamel layers you were getting alternating signals so they were clearly spent Spending some time in one place, then some time in another place, then back in the first place, then in the second place again. And the interpretation of that is they're just migrating backwards and forwards. I would expect fish in, say, a basin in the North Sea to probably have subtly different chemical signatures to one off the Brazilian coast. We could potentially do that with their teeth. See, I didn't realise you could do that with fossils and fossil enamel. So I knew you could do that with like human, because that's how they trace people. You know, they know that people buried by Stonehenge actually grew up in like Australia because of the tooth enamel analysis but I didn't realize that you could do that on fossilized animals you can it's the same idea but it's much easier to do on you know North American sauropods because there are so many sites with you know the same age with the same animals and you can just sample for their strontium isotopes but pterosaurs it's a bit more complicated I think um, I'm not sure if we can you know actually demonstrate it I mean uh, I do have a lots of fossils and lots of lots of teeth from Brazil or from Morocco but I don't have lots of teeth from China or from the UK because where are those teeth you know just all lost but but I was thinking at, at least for an individual you could still show that its enamel was alternating between sites or kept or it was a different chemical signature every layer and that would imply at the bare minimum a very long journey going on wouldn't that imply that they kept their teeth for a long time and if they regularly lost their teeth like a tyrannosaur would, then you're in trouble, aren't you? Well, it would be every few months, and there are, you know, there are things like, you know, albatross flying from the Antarctic to Brazil in three days. So, <laughs> <laughs> three months should be enough, you know. To yeah, get, we to, just to need get to get a really large sample to see if we can get yeah. any kind of signature in the sense. Because if you get a really lazy one, we just need money. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> yeah, money. Say, we'll, we'll get you back on next year, and you can explain how you did it then. <laughs> <laughs> it's very I mean it's pretty cool there are so many nice things we can do with stable isotopes I'm still uh, you know on the beginning of working with stable isotopes I've done something with uh, carbon and oxygen but also that you know that 3D thing you know when we as you say you know most pterosaurs are flat that's a point I've made again and again and again and they yeah, come from very few places to get decent numbers of them so yeah almost all the big models we've done on things like you know Mike Habib's work on t- 
takeoff and and the mechanics of Jaws, it's the Anhangarids because they're the only things where we've got 3D uncrushed pterosaurs. Yes. They they are. They they've become that you you know working model in a way that few others are. I mean, I've talked about we've used Ramphorhynchus because there's loads of specimens, but a lot of them are flat. We use Tyrannodon because there's loads of specimens, but they're very flat. But at least they're quite big. But yeah, if you if you want to do a, any kind of detailed study, again, Chris Bennett's wonderful work on muscle reconstructions. Guess what he used? Because that's the one that's 3D with everything preserved. Yeah. In that, you know, so yeah, they, they are right. super important animals for for our pterosaur research. Yeah, and there is actually some research coming from my lab with those uh, with this um, iron granite that is in Tokyo. And also one Ramphorinkos that's in um, Denmark and with uh, Asdarkids from Uzbekistan. So these are 3D. And because they are 3D, we were able to reconstruct ligaments and muscles and you know, cartilage from the neck. Excellent. So it's wonderful what we can do. CT scans are pretty cool, but even if you are not able to get images from within the bone, just getting you know a nice 3D exact model, you can just put it on the computer, reconstruct the missing parts, and then just compare with living animals, and that's it. We do have some very nice specimens that well, we have work to be done for ages because now we can actually do, you know, a lot of biomechanics and that's just the neck. We can do the same with wings because we've been, well, we've been doing things with wings for ages and with the legs. So all about locomotion and how they behaved and how they, well, they moved around. We all need to use those 3D fossils. They are wonderful. They're incredible. We can get all the information, how those muscles would look like, where they were you know, inserted and what would happen when they move bones. So it's incredible just to, to be able to use those fossils. Do their front wings attach to their rear wings? Have they got a membrane between their feet? Do we know? Uh, we don't know. Oh. You see, that's the sad part with the 3D specimens. When we have the flattened specimens, normally we also have some soft tissue preservation uh, that's more, I don't know, obvious to be seen, like wings, uh, membranes, and uh, patalgia. With those 3D fossils, we do have some different things being preserved on soft tissues. We might have some muscle tissue or some ligaments or, you know, something that we can only see under a microscope. Nothing we can use to actually, you know, uh, say something about the shape of the wings, about the shape of other membranes. Uh, there are some pretty cool things we can find. Oh, here's some, um, I don't know, muscle cell, and that's it. Or perhaps we can do something about the colors. But so far, people were only able to get colors from the 2D specimens because they have more soft tissue. And it's, I don't know, it's more obvious. We can actually see the soft tissue preserved. So that's the thing. We, we do have soft tissue, but not that useful for reconstructions. Just, you know, just cool to say, oh, yes, there, here lies a muscle. <laughs> <laughs> there used to be a muscle. There used to be uh, a bacteria or whatever. That's it. So so we do always have that problem of wing attachment. And I I mean, I've said before, and again, wrote, written a paper saying pterosaurs probably universally had an ankle attachment or something close to that. But yeah, all of the chirons are a group where it's just completely missing. But on the flip side, when we're saying long, thin wings, you can tell a little bit because the wings are very long compared to the small size of the body and the legs are pretty short and so even if you gave them like the fattest possible wing that you could possibly put on there to put it at the extreme level it's still going to be thinner than most of the others and then if they have anything like the shape of the wings of the others it's going to be really thin and that is what you'd expect from an oceanic flyer and everything that we see points to an oceanic flyer so it's one of those do we absolutely know this no but you'd struggle to say that the wing is any other shape than relatively narrow i've forgotten the name of the big one but of the big one because all of the like brachiopatagium so the arm membrane basically no 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 no, no, no. Oh. the big the big the big quetzalcoatlus pterosaur. not yeah. quetzalcoatlus but your version as, dark kids as well, a whole oh tropognathus oh, was tropognathus. the really tropognathus, big yeah so is the really big Quetzalcoatlus, um, you know, it's it's theorised it spent a lot of its time walking because it could. But these have got very small back legs. Were they walkers as well, do we think? Or were they really just adapted for flight? I think they would, I mean, just walk around, but not really, not really, really as um, as dark as would. 
because we do know that pterosaurs would well at, at least use their legs for walking around something uh, i don't know leaves or you know strolling around the beaches perhaps but yeah, not really beaches. just uh, to go you know to grand lands they would use them to try to just get on the air but then for a quadrupedal launch but most of them they would just fly around what about the size of their heads because you mentioned one that's eight meters i'm thinking is the size of their head sort of similar to an ashdarkid have they got really large heads compared to their body and long heads? yes really? yes the, the heads are they are all very disproportional all pterosaurs they're very strange particularly those uh, Cretaceous pterosaurs. So Tropiogonados will have some really, really large heads, but they're not the only ones. The Asdarkids would also have, the Pteranodontids would also have very, very large heads. So yeah, it was pretty, pretty large uh, in relation to the body. Probably very heavy for them to carry those heads around. Yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean that, that's why the crest, even the little anterior ones, is going to be a disadvantage. It's a big amount of weight on something stuck in front of your wings. That's the classic penalty of sexual selection is, that, you know, look at me. I can lug around this awful encumbrance that would ruin my biology were I not so wonderfully healthy and strong that I can deal with it. And that, that really is the signal. Yeah, I mean, the, the pterodactyloids in general have big heads. But yeah, these guys. Because <laughs> tapiarids, you know, tend to go t- tend oh, to go tall. They are but so yeah, good. the Ashdarkids and Orthochirids went long. And yeah, they're, they're massive. Yeah, the 8 meter Tropignathus, I haven't done the maths on it, but the, I mean, the skull must be, I know it's incomplete, but it must have been like a meter and a half plus long. Blimey. You know, that's, mm. I mean, it's nothing you like the size, but you're, you know, you're looking at like a tyrannosaur sized skull, at least in terms of length. For flying yeah, well, animals. at least one meter long, because yeah. um, at the time we described it, we did a reconstruction, uh, you know, for the press, and was about one meter long. It was something very, very robust because the crest, you know, it just starts getting thicker and thicker. It's really large. So the bits that people you're finding, you mentioned it at the start, is just the the main bit is at the bit at the front which holds the teeth in. Why is that the bit that gets most preserved? Do you think? I'm not sure if that's just the best preserved part. Because when I was um, taking a look at the pterosaurs from the Cambridge Green Sands, I was very surprised because I wouldn't find so many of the wing bones. And wing bones are large and they're very robust and uh, it's very easy to find them. They're large and they're straight, so you cannot miss them. But most of the material were tiny bits of the bigs and a lot of vertebrae. Lots and lots and lots of vertebrae. And I'm like, okay, so where's the wings? Not just the rest of the skull. Where's the wings? So probably uh, it's not just something that was preferentially preserved, but perhaps people who collect those fossils, they just chose the parts that they could Uh recognize as being fossils. Because the bits, they have all those holes where the teeth would go into. So, oh, it's recognizable. And the vertebrae are very, very distinct as well. So perhaps they have just collected and just sent to the museums the nice parts and the other ones were just tossed. Ah, yeah, so that human make error. A lot of sense. Well, because, yeah, yeah, but, yeah but really. That... I mean, where are the wings? Pterosaurs are mostly wings. They have only wings. They are so large. So where are all those wings? No one's really digging in the Cambridge Green Sand anymore and has no, for decades. It, it, so we, you can't easily check. No, we can. And then at the time those fossils were found, those were mines that were being mined for for phosphates right so it was not you know being mined by paleontologists but for you know mine workers would not be able to recognize easily some parts of the skulls because well they're ugly when they're not uh, completely preserved it's just tiny odd bits of bone so Perhaps they have been destroyed at the time. But it, I was just thinking, I mean, even people who would recognise them, though, what people were usually interested in was something new. And of course, it's a lot easier to identify even a broken and worn snout as being different to another animal than an isolated wing bone or ulna, where they look the same yeah. in absolutely every animal. Now, do we have a lot more to say about these, or can we talk a little bit about fossils themselves? Because I know that you are involved with a lot of discussions, particularly about about 
fossils from Brazil and the trade that goes on about it? Because you are an expert and we obviously have a lot of listeners who love fossils and don't want to sort of, you know, ruin any laws or anything like that. So I'm really interested to learn about a bit more about the trade in Brazil in particular, what's going wrong, what's going right and your opinions on it. Oh, OK. So, wow. <laughs> How long? We, we, no, we have only got another 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. It's um, legislation, uh, fossil legislation varies a lot. And each country has a different legislation because each country has a different culture regarding fossils. That's it. For a long, long time, we had no legislation on the matter whatsoever. But in 1942, we got our first uh, law that was aimed to protect the fossils. So a uh, paleontologist one day just knocked on the president's door and he was, okay, so we need a law to just preserve the fossils. We don't, I don't think it's, you know, all right to just send them uh, overseas to the US, for instance, or to Denmark. Well, you know, those things happened in the 18th and 19th centuries. So in 1942, uh, the president, uh, he wrote a law that said that all fossils belong to the nation, to the union, to Brazilians as a whole. So uh, if you want to dig a fossil here, Either you work for the government, so that's okay because you're already working for the government. You don't need to ask for authorization. But if you're coming from overseas, for instance, you you need proper... Yeah, if you're Dave. Dave is coming here. He will need some authorization to dig fossils. And there were lots of different pieces, tiny pieces of legislation over the years that gave more detail on how to proceed, uh, how I'm going to send an email, who are going to send this email to. Do I need to make uh, friends with someone in Brazil or university? Was, is someone going to, to dig with me? So that's it. We have some several uh, smaller pieces that not exactly laws, but infra legislation, like smaller pieces of legislation. So if they want to come here, he doesn't need to ask someone here to go with him. But uh, then the Ministry of Science will just point out someone to just see if it's not, you know, fooling around without fossils. So our legislation is very similar to what we see, for instance, in Canada or in Argentina, where the fossils belong to the government or to the nation. Well, government doesn't seem right. It belongs to the people of the country. So we are not allowed to sell them um, because they don't belong to a person, like a private person. They belong to the country. So it is illegal to sell them unless you have proper authorization. The thing is, because the Araripi fossils now, um, where those 3D pterosaurs come from, they're so incredible they're worth a lot of money on the black market. Mm -hmm. And until, I don't know, 1970s and 1980s, there was very little um, police enforcement of those rules. So a lot of people would just come and buy those fossils because they're very easy to find. You can just get a hammer and see what's inside. It's very, very easy to find them. You can find them anywhere. Just, you know, wait for some showers, stronger showers, and you can just find them anywhere in southern uh, Sierra, in the northeastern part it's of amazing. the country. They sound like, because we get sold these toys in the UK, mm-hmm. which are basically yes. just a toy inside mud. Yeah. And all you have to do uh, is yeah. take it in the bath and you find a, <laughs> a dinosaur. And it, that sounds almost exactly like you just wait for heavy rain. It's pretty much like that. It's just like a Kinder Egg. Do you know Kinder ah, Eggs? You have Kinder yeah, Eggs, Kinder there, eggs. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, not, we're not North America. We're, 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 we're trusted with them. <laughs> <laughs> so you just have to, you know, open the egg and find the toy inside. That's it. You just have to, you know, use a hammer instead. It's very easy to be transported, very easy to find. And until the 1980s, the region of the country where those fossils come from was very poor. So people would just send, sell these fossils for, I don't know, five, ten dollars. It wow. was nothing for them. It, they would just get them those, you know, down the street. It was very easy. So a lot of people would just buy those fossils. Of course, no one from a museum will come over here, just open up their pockets and buy some fossils. There are people who are you no know, buyers. They come here, they buy from those people, you know, more you know, from a poor part of the country, and then just sell overseas for a large, large profit. Pterosaurs, crocodilians, um, actually crocodilomorphs, because we have no, so many notosuchians. Dinosaurs, fishes, they're all over the place, all over you know the globe, really. 
So that's how they left the country, because in the 1970s and the 1980s, legislation existed, but policies were not being really enforced. And then oh, sometime during the 1990s, some paleontologists started working on this part of the country and they were not happy. So they decided to go to the press and complain about those things. And they're correct because the legislation already existed since the 1940s. And they were like, oh, we are losing our best fossils and we're getting nothing in return. They, you know, if you're buying illegal things, you don't pay taxes. You don't get people jobs. Um, we gain nothing in return for those things. So, so they did a lot, a lot of pressure. And I think most museums is, uh, stopped buying fossils or illegal fossils around that, that time. I mean, from the 1990s until I know, early 2000s, people perhaps would still buy, but they don't do this nowadays. It's not ethical to do this. You have to have responsibility with the budget. We still have, you know, some people that are buying for private collections, so they don't have um, this kind of constraints about budget. If you have money, you can just buy it, you know, just depends on your conscience. But then um, as, you know, time was passing, more and more paleontologists just started being more vocal. And uh, that's why the issue is being so often talked about, you know, nowadays. And of course, we have social media and people are very vocal on social media. It's so much easier to just post something and everyone, regardless where they are, will just read what you have to say. We have so many fossils that have been smuggled out of, out of the country. They were illegal sold because we never gave we I mean the country never gave authorization for them to be sold and of course it's not just you know the ugly fishes or ugly insects we have so many nice fossils that left the country so there's dinosaurs and pterosaurs and almost complete pterosaurs and um, dinosaurs with feathers pterosaurs with fibers that are you know featherish fibers. There's so many cool things that left the country. A lot of, well, my colleagues and I, we try to just have some nice conversations with curators from, or researchers from museums all over the, you know, all over the place to see if we can get uh, those fossils repatriated without any hustle. We don't mm. need to. It's the right thing to do. Just return the fossils. We can do um, long-term loans if you want to keep them in a nice exhibit, for instance. There are so many ways to get fossils still to be available to people overseas. But the real, really different, difficult thing is that there are still a lot of shops that sell those fossils and they are not going to return because they paid for those fossils. Yeah. So, yeah. So a few years ago, I saw some fossils being sold on eBay. It was a really, really cool pterosaur and I didn't wear it. So I went to the police and I did a formal report. And then seven years later, boom, they found out that this shop in France had over 100 fossils, all illegal fossils from Brazil. And they are about to be returned now. But it's so complicated because, well, who's paying for them to be shipped? Who's going to pay for insurance for those fossils? Because we are going to pay for them or one of those universities here are going to pay for shipping and insurance, it's very, very expensive to get those things insured. Well, and, and you got to store it and look after it when you get it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not about just bringing in the suitcase. Like, I mean, if I had like two or three insects, I could do that. It's fine, just put it on the suitcase. But 100 fossils, no way. They don't fit in any suitcase. It's very bureaucratic. If I'm going to talk uh, to a museum, I don't know, I could just knock on the door at the American Museum of Natural History and ask them to return some insects. They would just feel nicely in a shoebox because they're small. So I could just, you know, just get a letter and bring them back. But really heavy fossils? Particularly as they're so delicate as well. Yeah, I know, yeah. right? So I just can't ship them um, if they are, have been completely prepared, for instance. Because if they're unprepared, oh, that's fine. There's still a lot of rocks surrounding. But if they have already been prepared, they're very, very fragile. Oh, God knows how many times I just looked at a fossil and then suddenly broke. Yeah. So <laughs> it happens too often. One thing I was going to say, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bit late. It, it goes back to something you were saying earlier, but I think people often don't think of or appreciate with this kind of problem as well, with that export 
sort of stuff. You know, you see discussions online and people are like, oh, well, you know, well, why aren't the customs stopping it? And it's like, you know, the average customs officer is not familiar with every single detail of law for every possible good checking the border. And they're probably more concerned about people shipping drugs and money and Weapons. far more valuable things. Perhaps live animals. You can find live animals. So um, it's really, really hard to get those people trained. Because, right, because well, they've got, you know, e e even as a paleontologist, I look at it, there's, there's better things for them to be doing than learning the minutiae. Okay, in Brazil, it's fairly sim simple where it's all illegal. But for a lot of other countries where it's like, oh, well, it depends on what species it is. Oh, yeah, because they're taxonomists <laughs> now. You know, there's that one. It's very interesting that uh, you asked this. Most fossils probably don't, li they don't, probably don't leave the country uh, by plane. Yeah. Because we... We do export yeah, they're going a in a shipping container. Yeah, that in no a shipping one container. So we are exporting at. rocks. So yeah. you're buying, a, a, I don't know, I don't know how many containers of rocks you want to buy. All those nice rocks where we find the cradle specimens. Yeah, the flat ones. The, the, yeah, they are flat. They're like squares, and you can just put them on your floor. They look great. Well, yeah, you again, know? because you, and you yeah. ship them abroad because they're yeah. they're tiles. Yeah, and um, they're pretty nice lithographic stones. They look super cool. So if you just put one or two or three slabs in the middle of hundreds of other slabs, no one in will, will be able to find them. Who will just check slab per slab in a ship full of uh, containers of, yeah, of each container of them, yeah, right. it's impossible so, so yeah. the thing is having the police police every single ship every single container no nope, that's never going to happen and brazil has eight thousand kilometers of a coast right i mean that, that's, the, very, very that, that's the thing when when people are exporting you know hundreds of kilos of drugs at a time and export people are missing it you're gonna be able to get through a slab no one rock. cares <laughs> No one those. Knocking, it's noticing. impossible. So yeah. the thing is, we need more uh, police enforcement at the mines yeah, it's, yeah, when it's the they source. actually found the fossils. Yeah, yeah. So it's that's the thing. Um, so there are a few colleagues of mine from the university in Serra that they have a project with the miners. So they, you know, just go there and talk to people and tell them how important it is to preserve the fossils. And mo nowadays, most mine workers, they want to do the right thing. They will not sell the fossils anymore because, well, perhaps someday the children will be paleontologists yeah, yeah. as well. We have now a museum. The museum is now over 20 years old, I think, at the city. So now because we have museums and the universities and the researchers are there all the time, they now can see that they Paleontology is a real thing, you know, not yeah. just a TV thing. All of them, they value a lot. Yeah, it's the, it's so the it's classic really local engagement work. thing. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. really hard work. And they also have a super interesting project with the police. So the police will just drop by those mines, I don't know, once a week or something, or once a fortnight. And they just collect the fossils. They just, oh, I have found this and this, and you can take this to the museum. And the police will do the transport of the fossils from the mines to the museum. Museums. So that's something that can be done because we don't have enough paleontologists doing the job of going to each mine, each outcrop to see what they're doing. I mean, um, we should have, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. So those projects with the police, they are working great. We are going to have a lot of interesting things going on because when you work in a mine, it's so much easier to find cool fossils than me not trying to dig. Yeah, going for a week shovel. with two students. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I can take 10 students with me and still we're still working with shovels and hammers. So no, I'm not going to find anything that looks like a birajara or something <laughs> or even a pterosaur. The only time I went to um, a field work that we actually found a pterosaur was a very large wing and was fantastic, but no skull. So, oh. man. I'm sensing this would make an excellent TV show, though. You've got police, pterosaur, paleontology action yeah. in a mine. Oh, yeah. Oh, let's cool. call Netflix. 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Awesome. I think as well as it being policed on the ground, also people just make sure that when you go to buy a fossil, maybe for a friend or a loved one or for yourself, you get it from a reputable source and they can say, this is from Morocco and it's sold through illegal trade rather yeah. than from mm, Brazil. Yeah. If you see something from Brazil, it's not for sale. I mean, the, 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 re- not, the really sale. short list is Brazil, Mongolia, China are the three countries which pretty much have a universal ban on anything being exported full stop end of story so anything ever listed from those places is questionable at best I think it's yeah, fairly sad. after that it gets way more complicated but th- those three all have pretty much blanket laws saying you're not allowed to export or sell anything ever there are of course exceptions for museums and historical blah de blah, blah but if you're yeah if you're looking online or seeing in a shop and it's listed as one of those countries just leave it just don't buy those fossils from mongolia or from brazil it's or from china it's not worth it because i'm going to tell the police you have bought it (laughs) and it's cool to have resin because if you have resin and you drop it it's all right you don't feel guilty yeah i know right I mean, I, I know, I, I get it. I get it. As a paleontologist, I get it. Why people want to have fossils at home. It's nice to have something cool, but we do have to think about all those implications. So what's the ethical background of those fossils? So they were mostly likely uh, illegally exported. That means fossil trafficking. That's not cool. It's not something ethical. You don't want to have these kind of things in your home. You want to do you know, the best thing possible. And even in countries where private collections are common, where selling fossils are allowed, some very, very cool fossils have been lost before. So we have to ensure that future generations will be able to see all those fossils. There's, for instance, um, one Archaeopteryx that's missing for decades so where is it? Is it true that the owner of the Archaeopteryx has you know, the, the fossil to be buried with him when he you know, passed away? Yeah, that's the, that's, that's the rumor. That's the rumor. I love this rumor, but really... But even what the Thermopolis one, you know, the one that went to Wyoming, that one, my understanding, because I was in Germany when that came out, my understanding from the from the people in the know is that one came out of the blue. It had clearly been dug up a long time ago and prepped, and then it just appeared. And like it's easy to say, like, like Archaeopteryx is not something that you can keep a secret. And this is yeah. back in the day when there were like six, whereas now we're up to like 14. Yeah, I like, know. And, and then... And clearly this thing had been around for decades. And the assumption was it had been found immediately recognised what it was and shoved in a vault in Switzerland. Ooh. And then when someone wanted the money, it suddenly appeared again. It's really strange, isn't it? Because um, then what did Germany do? They passed a new law that regards, among other things, fossils. So uh, nowadays, you cannot just sell those kind of things. They are much more restrict for rare or very important fossils. They don't care if you buy, I don't know, um, some ammonites. They're so common. But you, if I'm you do have... Yeah, ammonites are cool. But if you find an Archaeopteryx, most likely will not, you will not be able to ship it outside Germany nowadays. So, so the, I, I know they tried to mount a legal challenge over the one that went to Wyoming. I'm not an expert on the law of fossils in general, and even Munich in particular. So Bavaria has different laws to the rest of Germany, first issue. Uh, but my understanding was is that when something was as valuable as something like Archaeopteryx, scientifically, as well as the obviously monetary valuable, particularly scientifically, the rule was basically you were allowed to sell it, but you had to offer it to a museum first for market value mm. to give them the opportunity to take it into their collection if they wanted and the legal challenge was it's not that it was illegal to sell this to the states but we didn't know about it until the sale was made and that's breaching the law and then i think they basically discovered that they couldn't afford to pay what wyoming had offered for it so it kind of became redundant to mount a legal challenge that even if you won you couldn't fulfill your side of the contract yeah it would be interesting from an ethical point of view to just you know, return the fossils to the place where they come yeah. from because then you can educate people from the place. But not always is the case with legislation. A lot of countries have legislation. Uh, each province has one different piece of legislation, like Germany does that, Canada does that. Well, Canada is yeah, very yeah, strict with the fossils different. as well. Yeah, but then Alberta so, is different for the rest, which yeah people don't realise. Yeah, Alberta is very different. They're very strict from the rest 
but then um, it's, it's still from an ethical point of view, it's quite interesting to actually have the fossils where they come from. Perhaps not all of them, but the most important fossils, because um, we want to educate people, right? Oh, we yeah. don't want to just study the fossils all by myself. Oh yeah, they all belong to me. That's very silly. Although a lot of people actually do this, it's very silly. Fossils should be, you know, in the open in museums for everyone to see and not locked out, you know, oh, yeah. in my office. And you can always loan them. You can always loan them. But I, I mean, I guess where we're going with this is thinking about how to do it best for the circumstances that are local. And I think the problem you get from, let's say, some vocal people is a one blanket approach that absolutely everything should be like this everywhere. And that's the problem that we're not doing X. And it's like, that is almost never going to be practically possible and in a lot of cases probably actively working against your interest you know you need some practicality and some pragmatism and to take into account the people the fossils the money and you know and i don't i don't mean that in a in a value way i mean yeah if you have an extremely poor community you can't just build them a museum you know we, the government or local people may not have that money so it's you can't just say well build a museum and that solves the problem because it, it really doesn't we really knew, need need some more things like in Araripi when they built a small museum because it's a very small village where the fossils come from it's incredible it's really really small and someone one day well a professor at the university he decided to build a small museum the university is not actually in the small village it's in a, no, a larger city nearby a few kilometers so because of that, he began a whole process of having some tourists go there and uh, mostly a lot of people, you know, uh, school children would visit the, uh, the museum because, well, there are always children visiting the museums, museums all the time. They, do, they yeah. love it. I mean, it's pretty cool. But then um, now, decades later, they have a geopark. And the geopark has several routes where people can do trekking or buy stuff or go to a restaurant. Well, they people will need to, you know, eat. So oh, they need juice boxes. A, a new, Kids need juice yeah. boxes. Oh yes, they need juice mm, boxes. So here's, you know, um, a restaurant or here's a hotel or you can buy souvenirs from this museum or this person and this other person. So it always started with a very small museum that one man decided to build. On his last day on the office, <laughs> because then no one would, could say no. Can't you stop know. it yet. <laughs> it's amazing. So he decided to build this museum, and now several years. But of course, it's not because one man did the first step, and then several other people did a whole bunch of other steps for um, for some sort of paleo or geo tourism in the area. People love doing trekking. I don't know why, but people love trekking. <laughs> And uh, you need to go to a nice place where you can take nice pictures. So here it is. Uh, you now have a geo point where you can just go there and see how, how nice the plateau looks. Oh, wow. Pictures, pictures, pictures. Here's a restaurant. Here's a souvenir guy. And you know. So it has to you know, begin from somewhere. But it, we cannot just begin things for, out of the blue. The university was already there in the near, not exactly in the village, but in a city nearby. Because people will you know, just stop thinking about fossils as um, a chance to get some easy dollars from um, some shady tourists. And now mm -hmm. uh, they actually see uh, the fossils at their heritage. Uh, their kids are going to university now, which was, well, quite different reality from 20, 30, 40 years ago. So things, they change a bite very, very slowly. And now you're listening to the economics podcast. That's an example of the multiplier effect. <laughs> for you economic <laughs> students. Um, that's amazing. Thank you so much for spending um, your time explaining all that to us. And as well, talking about the flappy flaps. of uh, That's what I call pterosaurs. Uh, flappy flaps, because that's what they do. <laughs> Except your one's really a more sorry sores than flappy flaps. So um, thank you so much for coming on Terrible Lizards. Where can people find out more about you? Oh, I'm on Twitter. Yeah, at Paleo Thaisa. Paleo Thaisa just... Uh, you can write me silly things on the flappy things, flappy, <laughs> flappy things. Yeah, flappy um, flaps. I like it. Flappy flaps. You can send me things there. Um, 
I try to occasionally post things in English, but then, um, well, sorry, you can no, just... You, you, you post in English the translation. in Portuguese, but, right, but the translate function is fine. So, yeah, the translation, yeah. Translate works. just use the translation, uh, translation thing, button thing in Twitter, and I'll just reply to you in English, no, no problem at all. I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you so oh, much for the you. opportunity. So I love talking on. about pterosaurs. There's a lot to think about and a lot to process there. And I think it's really cool that we, you know, are covering how, why all these laws were put into place in the first place. But it's also nice to have a, you know, as as we did, you know, a reasonable discussion about it, because, you know, there there are some proper free market rules, everything people online. And there are, if anything, some people going the other way of the hyper, every possible dot of a fragment should be preserved for all time. And whether we like it or not, you know, not everyone fits with what we want things to do. Um, and the differences between different regions and different governments and different people. And frankly, pragmatism is always going to mean that it is never going to be an either or discussion, however much one side or the other would rather that it were. And so having someone who I think is an excellent advocate for the, if you like, national interest point of view and the protectionist point of view, but who also recognises this is part of a bigger issue and a bigger debate and borders and ethics and all the rest of it, is so nice because it means you can have a reasoned discussion. (laughs) Yes, this isn't a Reddit thread of angry people. This is a lovely podcast. There are no threads on Reddit full of angry people. There are threads on Reddit full of angry, ignorant people. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he said annoying that fan base <laughs> exactly why not why not anyway um thank you very much for listening ladies and germs we will be back next week and until then should we do a squawk because we talked about uh flappy flaps yes shall we do <laughs> or pterosaurs he's he's he's, he's going to take off his headphones now as i prepare for my squawk of dreams okay three two one <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for downloading this episode of Terrible Lizards. For extra content, become a patron on patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. Dave's book, The Future of Dinosaurs, or How Fast Did T-Rex Run, is available to buy now. Do check out Izzy Lawrence's other podcasts and books by visiting iszi.com. Please send questions, suggestions, and other feedback to terriblelizardspod at gmail.com and catch up with old live episodes on youtube.com forward slash I-S-Z-I tube. Do leave us a review, it does make a difference, and find us on social media and say hello with the hashtag Terrible Lizards. Thanks again to our patrons. Without your support, we wouldn't be making this series. 